So remember, as VFR pilots, you're actually going to be do, doing stuff that is in some ways more challenging than what airline pilots do because you're always trying to keep clearances from clouds that the IFR pilots don't care about. And if you're flying a low performance airplane, you're also uh, dealing with uh, you know, flying through the weather instead of just going on top of it. So uh, while you're the VFR only pilot, uh, these non-local flights uh, really pay attention to weather. Airspace, go and study this a little bit before the exam. Um, here are the different kinds. Remember, class A is up high, you need an instrument clearance. Class B is around the biggest airports. Class Charlie is around Manchester, New Hampshire. And uh, D is uh, for Hanscom. And E is kind of everywhere else. OK. Uh, the goal for the basic VFR weather minimums is to uh, make sure that an IFR plane coming out of the cloud has time to see and avoid you. Because the air traffic controller's job is to separate IFR airplanes from each other. It's not to separate IFR and VFR traffic. They will tell you about them, uh, but you're responsible as a VFR pilot for staying reasonably clear of clouds. So just uh, review these uh, cloud clearances. Um, class E, you can see that uh, this is a pretty good one to remember for the test. 500 below, 1,000 above, 2,000 horizontally. Uh, if you're really low in Class G airspace, you can do some crazy stuff. Uh, again, I don't think that this is really there to let you, you know, go from Boston uh, to Chicago, scud running, um, with, uh, you know, one mile of visibility and just clear of the clouds. I think it's more to enable people to, say, take off and do pattern work at uh, their home airport in some kind of little tiny, very slow airplane. Pattern work is just what we were driving on the chalkboard, flying the traffic pattern at an airport. OK. So again, yeah, just review the presentation or the FA book so you know your weather minimums. Um, yeah, incredibly, at night for Class G, getting back to that pattern work thing, if you want to go out and practice takeoffs and landings at night, if you stay within half a mile of the runway, you can uh, go right down to one mile of uh, visibility and right up, right up to the clouds. Uh, OK. Here's that chart again. Learn it, know it. Uh, special VFR. Actually, if you're at Hanscom and the weather is below uh, the basic minimums and you say you want to do some pattern work anyway, either in a helicopter or in an airplane, uh, you can request. They can't offer it, but you can request a special VFR clearance. And they'll say, OK, there's not too much IFR traffic right now. So uh, you, uh, you know, take off and land and do your, uh, do your stuff. If it's a night, you'll have to be an IFR pilot, basically. Uh, Cirrus publishes this good personal minimum matrix. Uh, I wouldn't say that you have to adopt uh, their specific numbers, but I think their way of thinking isn't bad. So notice they're saying, you know, if you are, uh, let's see, an average pilot, so you've got, uh, you know, 10 IFR hours within the last 90 days, you've done you know, one non-autopilot approach within the last 90 days. We'll go over here and go down to a 500-foot ceiling and two miles of visibility. Don't go down to the published approach minimums, which are designed for a two-pilot professional crew, unless, you know, you're very current. You've done a whole bunch of flying in the last 90 days. Um, anyway, so they just try to fit. They try to say, how challenging is this flight? Uh, how experienced are you in general? How experienced are you recently? and uh, come up with some numbers. So again, you can pull this out of the slide. And just to clarify what we're talking about when we talk about personal minimums. So there are, there are minimums that you have to know for the FAA exam, like we were just talking about in terms of the minimum visibility that must be uh, there in order to, for you to fly in certain classes of airspace. But then there are also minimums that you set on yourself to be a safe pilot and to be kind of knowledgeable about what your restrictions and what your experience and what your currency is. So for example, we talked about crosswind. So there isn't an FAA uh, reg necessarily, you know, as long as it's within your aircraft's 
operating conditions, there's no specific reason why you know, a 15 or 20 knot uh, crosswind is a problem, but maybe you're not very comfortable with it, you haven't done a lot of slips recently, um, you're still getting used to your aircraft, so you might say you know, a, a smaller uh, crosswind or gusting winds would be appropriate for you to land it. So that's setting a personal minimum on yourself, and this, this is an example of, of personal minimums based on your experience and your currency. Yeah, and the FAA will never suggest this, but the appropriate escape from you know, a challenging situation that you think might be uh, on the edge of safety is to rent the five-seat SR-22 instead of the four-seat uh, SR-20 and go with an instructor. Uh, so it's as easy as that. Okay, remember this was confusing. They used category and class to mean totally, two totally different things. For getting your pilot certificate, the uh, category is there on the left, something like a, an airplane versus a rotorcraft, and the class would be you know, multi-engine land versus a helicopter, category, class. But then for aircraft, they do something totally different, and they say category would be you know, normal category or acrobatic, and class would be uh, airplane. So they may ask you about this just because they like to torture you. Uh, the four forces of flight, remember these. Tina talked about them. If you're just bombing along, uh, straight and level, not accelerating, then they're gonna all be in balance, because F equals MA. A equals whatever, can't remember the math. Anyway, F equals MA, I know that much. Uh, remember these three axes, they'll ask you about this on the test, usually in combination with some other stuff. So rotation about the vertical axis is gonna be uh, yaw. Rotation about the, uh, this is complicated, let's see. Rotation about the lateral axis is gonna be pitch. Rotation around the longitudinal axis, I believe, will be roll. So that's a little bit confusing since, uh, yeah, here we have it. Pitch, roll, yaw. Right, so think about it. Uh, roll is really the lateral motion, but it's around the longitudinal axis. So don't get uh, confused there. Uh, remember why Johnny Cessna can't hover is also a limit for, uh, this, is, this limits everything basically. The stalling angle of attack is why you need a helicopter if you want to hover, and it is uh, why you need to maintain a reasonable airspeed when you're uh, landing, and it's also, uh, it limits your runway, right? If you had an airplane that uh, didn't stall till it reached some crazy angle of attack, you could probably take off and land in uh, 50 feet. Right, and remember that um, we talked about even a paper airplane can generate lift. So um, it's not about the shape of the cross section of the wing that is making you be able to generate lift. It's the angle of attack and your ability to deflect air molecules down. That's what generates lift. That shape of the airfoil is just what Philip was saying. That allows you to um, have the stall speed be lower. All right, so remember your left turning tendencies. Uh, mostly you just remember that uh, you need right rudder. Um, and a couple questions uh, had come up on gyroscopic precession, so I added uh, two videos about gyroscopes to help you understand gyroscopic precession and why that force is applied 90 degrees later. And so those are really fun videos you can look at. They're in the slide deck called Q&A and Review. Okay, so let's go back to the altitudes. So true altitude is your actual height above sea level. This is what's important if you want to get over uh, a mountain because the altitude on the chart for the mountain is also the actual height above sea level. Indicated is what your altimeter shows. If you're below 18,000 feet and it's not some insane temperature and you've got a current altimeter setting from air traffic control as you fly along with VFR advisories, they'll keep updating you with altitudes. If you're not talking to ATC, you, know, you may tune into the uh, airports that you're flying over to get the altimeter there. Uh, if you have your correctly set altimeter, it should be pretty close to your true altitude, um, but, uh, and the GPS uh, will give it to you as well. All right, absolute height above the ground. I don't think that's uh, ever really relevant. Pressure altitude is what you see if you tune your uh, altimeter to 299 or 2. Uh, density is uh, critical for determining performance of both the aircraft and the engine. So that's uh, a measure of you know, how many actual molecules of uh, 
air are there going to be in a uh, one liter cylinder, for example. Uh, know your taxiway and runway markings. This is, has practical value and also test value. Uh, one easy thing to remember is if you're driving along a taxiway in your aircraft, you will see yellow paint on a black paved surface. So that sign tells you what taxiway that you're actually on, just like the real world experience of yellow paint on black. Uh, everything else is kind of reasonably self-explanatory. They probably, even though if you're not an instrument pilot, they want you to know about this ILS hold short line. So if it's uh, kind of bad weather conditions, and they're using the ILS, they don't want you going beyond there because your metal airplane might interfere with the uh, radio beams that are being sent up to landing IFR airplanes. Uh, remember L over D max uh, for best glide speed. So all these climb speeds, glide speeds, et cetera, are driven off of the uh, points at which uh, the dra various drags uh, reach a minimum or a minimum per, uh, per mile traveled. Thunderstorms, the one thing you, uh, I hope you do remember is that everything's bad about convective clouds. Unstable air leads to uh, cumulus clouds. They can become cumulonimbus clouds. And now you have uh, a really bad hazard to aviation with terrible icing, terrible turbulence, maybe hail. Uh, so the squall line, I think they sometimes ask about this on the test the frontal band of thunderstorms. So just, you know, it's hard to get around them. Uh, and, uh, you know, you may have to go 500 miles out of your way to get around a cold front or hang out on the ground for a few hours and wait for it to pass. Also, just big changes um, in weather usually are not a good thing. So whether it's a big change in the barometric pressure or as we saw from yesterday to today, to today like a 40, 50 degree increase in the temperature, uh, it's going to be accompanied by massive gusting winds. Today is not a good day to go flying. Yeah, although actually it might not just be the day. It might be, um, you know, now we're ferrying a helicopter from Los Angeles back to Boston and, you know, there was a thunderstorm coming in. So. We just landed in an airport. It was probably gusting about 30 knots at the time, which isn't that bad for a Robinson, a four-seat Robinson. Put the helicopter in a hangar. You know, there was a huge storm. And uh, two hours later, later we uh, took off in beautiful weather and continued our flight. So uh, don't, you know, there, there is an airport usually every 10 or 15 minutes of flight time. So take advantage of that. If things are getting uh, beyond your comfort zone, don't just uh, blindly continue to your destination. So remember, the lee side of mountains is where you can get a lot of turbulence and downdrafts. Uh, a little airplane doesn't have a whole lot of climb performance usually, especially up at higher altitudes. So be cautious about crossing big mountain ranges uh, unless the winds aloft forecast is uh, for very light winds indeed. Uh, icing, also super bad. Again, as VFR pilots, you shouldn't have to worry about this once you get into instrument flying, as I hope a lot of you will. Uh, this is really what limits your ability to travel around in a Piper Cessna or Cirrus during the uh, uh, winter and uh, shoulder seasons. Uh, remember how to read a METAR. So this is back to Petrie de Kalb Airport in Atlanta. So there's, it's the 16th, it's 1653. So about uh, five, almost 5 p.m. in London, Zulu time. Winds are variable at four, 10 statute miles of visibility. Overcast 6,000 feet. That's 6,000 feet above the airport, not above sea level. Uh, temps 14, dew points minus 7. Altimeters 3015. Oh, and uh, in the remarks it says the rain ended 46 minutes after the hour. There you have it. All right. Human factor summary. So you are the weakest link. And uh, if you uh, develop some personal minimums, you'll be way ahead of the game. Um, they should also factor in your recent experience, not just your overall uh, level of flying. And uh, always remember that it's a big aviation community. There's a lot of people who are happy to go flying. You can send mail to the uh, members of the MIT Flying Club and just take a co-pilot. That's how the airlines uh, have cut risk almost to zero. Magnetic variation. This is uh, kind of a... Uh, uh, topic that tends to snag people on the uh, knowledge test. So just remember, you can re-derive it from the uh, VOR if you ever get uh, stuck. And uh, east is least, west is best.
uh, deviation, then don't, uh, don't get deviation and variation confused. So deviation, remember, is that tiny little correction that's printed uh, right underneath the compass. Uh, flight planning tip, uh, you saw this slide earlier. Um, even the FAR 61 and FAR 91 allow it, it doesn't mean it's wise. So if you look at FAR 121 and FAR 135 uh, for charter and scheduled airline service, they show you that uh, there's some extra safety margins that can be built in. Uh, night flying advice you just heard. Uh, remember, as the owner operator, you're responsible for um, keeping the airplane airworthy uh, if you do choose to go out and buy an aircraft. So these responsibilities are, you know, for most of you, going to be on the flight school. However, uh, you're still the final authority as the pilot, uh, and you can deviate from the rules in an emergency, uh, and you only have to report the deviation if requested. I think the, the feds like to ask this on the knowledge test because the natural answer is, of course, you have to report the deviation. And I declared an emergency and I broke the rules. But you don't actually have to report that unless they ask you to. But even uh, aside from an emergency, you're the pilot in command. Even if someone very assertively tells you to land and hold short or to fly straight to the numbers, which means don't fly the profit, proper traffic pattern but, but land very quickly, or tells you, you know, no delay on the go because they want you to get out quickly, they have other jets, you can just say unable and they have to deal with it <laughs> and make sure you're flying safely. And if you, especially as a student pilot, need extra time or extra consideration, just add student pilot to the end of all your radio calls and they'll give you uh, plenty of room to make mistakes, but they might also make you sit there and fly a bunch of 360s while they land everybody else and then give you time to <laughs> land. Uh, yeah, so safety is not high tech. Um, it should be probably. You know, we should actually, all the stuff that Michael, uh, showed you that's embedded in that DJI dr drone should probably be in these multi-million dollar aircraft, but it's not. Um, so in the meantime, uh, you know, since an airliner isn't actually that much uh, smarter than a little Cessna, you know, why is it safer? And if you take that perspective and just adapt all the things the airlines have done, you can make flying that little Cessna uh, dramatically safer. Um, so that means recurrent training, you know, maybe go up with an instructor every three months uh, instead of the every two years that the FAA requires. Uh, instrument flying skills are really important for VFR uh, safety. They make you a much better pilot, you know, at night as we've uh, just discussed and uh, even bombing around during the day. You'll be able to fly with about 5% of your mental energy instead of 50% uh, if you uh, are an instrument rated pilot. Uh, on a nice VFR day. Uh, the two-pilot crew and checklist is really the cornerstone of the airline safety system. So, and you can take advantage of that as a GA pilot, even though the FAA, you know, really about 5% uh, of the FAA, which is the one you've seen and interacted with, is all about encouraging people to be single pilots. And 95% of the FAA is about forbidding people to uh, operate single pilot. Every part of the FAA that regulates, uh, you know, the airlines and charters of uh, sizable airplanes, they say, no, of course you can't operate single pilot. That would be uh, incredibly dangerous. All right, so just remember, uh, study a little bit about the uh, Part 61 and Part 91 for learning to, uh, you know, what does it take to be and maintain your uh, status as a pilot uh, or be able to exercise your privilege as a pilot. That certificate never expires. Uh, part 91 is about what you can do with an airplane operated privately. And then uh, there's this little corner over there under Title 49, Part uh, 830, having to do with accident reporting and investigation. If you want to get 100 on the FAA knowledge test, uh, a lot of East Coast Aero Club customers seem to overstudy. I see a lot of 95s, 97s, 98s, uh, and 100s, uh, actual 100s. Uh, just reread the FAA textbooks. I mean, they can't ask you anything that's not in one of their own PDFs. Uh, that includes the FAR AIM, though, the, the regulations and the aeronautical information manual. Uh, there are test prep books and online equivalents uh, that are worth it. To finish this course, actually, you can get this. Um, you'll be able to get, actually, we don't even need to email you because if you have the course homepage, you can see it here. Uh, you go to this King Schools thing and you say you want to do uh, 60 questions. 
60 is the number of questions on the actual exam, so we're making our final exam being the same. And then you start test and you send us the results. And we'll be happy. All right, next steps. If you want to continue your journey beyond this class, maybe that's for the uh, one or two people. Um, and can I for borrow whom that the applies, point? that actually want to continue their journey. Can I borrow the pointer for just a second? You just for the guys that were getting tripped up thinking it was a river, this is exactly what we were talking about. This is uh, Boston Logan. These blue lines, circles that are around it are not rivers. It's indicating that class Bravo airspace. And I have it open over here if you want to take a look. OK, uh, so yeah, join the flying club. Go visit a flight school. Uh, most of the busier US airports have some kind of flight school that you can do. And uh, yeah, in the two hours that are remaining to me uh, for this presentation, I would just like to say thank you. Yeah, we're for... saying thank you, but just to clarify, there's, <laughs> there's a, a really cool uh, guest speaker coming next. But for, for the purposes of our teaching, uh, thank you very much, and we'll take any questions.